Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the 20th episode of Speak Up Am Yisrael. This is a special program that is dedicated to countering the missionary efforts that are targeting the Jewish people. We have Jewish educators, we have non-Jewish educators, we have Noahides, we have influencers, we have people from all spectrums and all different walks of life who are joining together in this wonderful initiative to protect the Jewish people from these missionary efforts. So today we're focusing on the Noahide movement, the righteous Gentiles among the nations who are supporting the Jewish people who are joining together at, together with us worshiping the God of Israel. And we're learning more about this wonderful movement. So today we have Yochanan Castan, Castellanos, I'm not sure how to say your name, forgive me, and Jim Long. Both of them have amazing initiatives for the Noahide movement and they're going to tell us about their initiatives very soon. But before we launch into this, I think we should just stop and review what exactly the Noahide movement is. You know, God gave the Torah to the Jewish people, and he gave us 613 commandments. And he also gave seven commandments for the entire world, that when we perform these mitzvahs, we come close to God and we create a wonderful world to live in. So for anybody who is not yet a Noahide or a Jew, I just wanted to quickly run through the list of the seven commandments. Now, these are the main categories of commandments, and there's a lot of details in how to correctly fulfill these commandments. So the commandments are not to worship idols, to know who God is, not to curse God, not to commit murder, not to commit sexual immorality, not to steal, not to eat flesh from a living animal, and to establish courts of justice. If people from all walks of life accept these upon themselves, it's going to be an amazing world. So now let's get to know a little bit about our guest. So we have Yochanan. Castellanos. What's your story? How did you come to be where you are now? I, I was born to a Christian family in San Antonio, Texas. And we belong to a, a church um, by comparison to other denominations, uh, a small, uh, small in number. It was called, it is called the Church of God Seventh Day. Going from leaving the church to becoming a religious Jew is a huge step. What did that involve? And what was the biggest challenge? Um, what, what happened is that uh, in, in San Antonio, under that church and the practices that we had, I would eventually become uh, a, uh, an ordained minister, pastor, and I would serve in the Austin area, Austin, Texas uh, area for about 22 years. And it was there that um, by some uh, events that uh, affected uh, my family and myself, my wife, my children, as we were serving as a pastoral family, uh, that we began to uh, question the uh, belief system that we had grown up with. And, and that's where I came to a moment of crisis. It was a scary uh, moment for me uh, personally, um, uh, because I was struggling at that moment when I make these uh, discoveries for me, uh, a discovery. Uh, I was trying to wrap my brain around the whole idea that everything that I had been taught, everything that I now was believing and was teaching, was not a correct uh, application, understanding of the holy scriptures. Uh, primarily among those teachings that I struggled with was salvation, atonement. And, and, and I had a moment of crisis. I, 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 it, it, it is said in, in, in their narrative, the Pauline scriptures say in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Revised Standard Version says the following, if Christ, their, their, their idea of if yes, who's or Jesus has has not been risen or he has not raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Now imagine that having that in your head as both a believer of many years and then now a teacher, a practitioner, to be confronted with that possibility that everything that I thought had been atoned for. I still was carrying it. That was scary for me. But I, wow. I eventually would find out uh, through further study, 
uh, I would find out that there is redemption without the gospel narratives and without the Pauline theology. And, and I, I would say I would encourage uh, people that find themselves in in, uh, in, in, in that crossroad that you're coming to terms both intellectually and spiritually. And, and, and it's going to be a scary prospect to be at that crossroad. But I, I would encourage you to keep moving in the direction that you are. Be aware, as it happened to me, that friends and family may end up cutting you out of their mm -hmm. lives. They may never want you back ever again. But you've got to be ready for that. They also, after hearing your uh, telling over what you have found, they may never get it per se, but you just have to keep moving because you're headed in the right direction to freedom, to redemption of your soul, to a, a new person. I'm sure there's so many more details we can go into, um, but let's flip over yes, to Jim yes. Long for a few minutes. I believe your path took a different turn. And when you left the church, you be decided to become a Ben Noach and embrace the seven universal commandments of all of mankind. Could you tell us about your journey? Basically, I recall at the age of nine years old being uh, having no problem believing there was a creator. I, I can remember vividly sitting under a tree, much like uh, Isaac Newton. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, actually... Uh, actually, I was laying on the ground on a summer day, beautiful summer day, looking up at the sky, and I remember a thought that stays with me to this day. I remember thinking that that God, I knew there was a God, but thinking the idea that God was was even bigger than the sky, and I remember it overwhelmed me. And and I remember from that point on through my whole life, my my whole journey, I kept looking for Hashem, as as I call Him today. Um. And wanted to know what was expected of me. I, I really wanted to do what God wanted me to do. So there were some hurdles along that way. And and one of them was the fact that my my mother uh, basically had my brother and I enrolled in Catholic school when we were of school age. And uh, so I didn't have any choice in the matter. And I was subjected to Catholicism and w embraced it as, as much as I knew how to because I thought it was... It represented the, the creator's uh, uh, desire for the world. And I walked away from it when I was in the eighth grade because I discovered something called the uh, um, the uh, the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> and I thought, wait a minute, this is not what the creator is all about. And, and you know, this we never heard the word of Spanish Inquisition while I was in Catholic school. And you can imagine why. <laughs> so... Basically, I thought, you know, this this couldn't be of of the of God, you know, the, the, this kind of bloody history, and then the dominance of the Catholic Church all through the centuries, especially in Europe. So I uh, I walked away from that, and I I I remained a believer in in the Creator in God, and it led me into uh, eventually uh, becoming a member of certain Protestant religions. I was a Church of Christ. I was in a couple of other permutations. And then in 1984, I dragged my family into a religious cult in East Texas. Wow. And of course, uh, my my two older sons still hold that against me. My son, Paul, didn't like it. Uh, my, my son, Jordan, didn't like it because they, they made him burn his Star Wars figures because they were considered, uh, you know, idols. Like so, so anyway... Um, basically, the reason I bring up the cult experience, which was four years long, the reason I, I was lured into it mm -hmm. is because I still consider myself a Christian, but I had a lot of questions that couldn't be answered. And um, when I, I was drawn into the cult because they were they also used archaeology as part of the drawing card. They actually took uh, they went overseas. They went to Eretz Israel. They went to Turkey. They, they scaled Mount Ararat looking for Noah's Ark. And they were they were they even published a photograph which was later used in a um, uh, a really well known documentary in the seventies called In Search of Noah's Ark. Well, this group took that picture, 
turned out later it was fake. It was a rock formation. I didn't know that at the time. But anyway, what was so pivotal for me in this is this this was this was after years of embracing Christianity and believing all the modern tenets and ideas. Of the, I believed in the Trinity. I believed um, I believed in mo the baptism and all of that. And so I I was I joined the, I, my family and I we we moved to East Texas to join this cult, and uh, they were called Holy Ground Mission, and it was the first time I heard the word Torah. And it was the first time I I I recognized or was taught that Shabbat was celebrated from Friday night, Friday evening up until Saturday evening. I'd never heard this before. I'd heard heard you know rumblings about well Sunday is not really the right Sabbath. Well these people embraced the Jewish Sabbath, and it was also where I learned that that the scriptures, even the so-called New Testament does not support the idea that J.C. is God. I, I was raised on this idea. I was raised on the idea of the Trinity, even though it never made any sense to me. And so, and I was shown, even in the so-called Gospels, where this idea and even this figure called Jesus even refuted the idea. There's a, a, there's a passage in Mark where uh, the, the rich young ruler runs up to to J.C. and says, uh, good master, how can I uh, inherit eternal life? And he says, um, why do you call me good? There is only one that is good, and that is God. Well, wait a minute. He just denied being God. And then, the, and I, if there's some, I know there's some former Christians listening, so you know the verses I'm talking about. And at another time, he's in a, he's in a synagogue, and he prays the Shema. And I, I, I don't understand why uh, I didn't see these things before, and it's because what happens in Christianity is we tended we tended to be very lazy, and we 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 were led around by the nose by Christian pastors. If Christians would really really read their Old Testament and and their new their New Testament uh, with the blinders off, well, what happened with me? It eventually led me out of Christianity because I noticed that what when J C would say something, he would say, "What doth the Scripture say?" I don't. I didn't know that they spoke old English back then. Small joke. Anyway, so and I, I thought to myself, wait a minute, he's quoting scriptures. Well, I knew that I had enough sense to figure out that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and all those things weren't around in those days. So what was he? He was talking about Torah. So I thought, I don't want secondhand information. I want to study Torah. So eventually, I led. After four years, we left the group. Because they were because the, the the leader of it, believe it or not, was an anti-Semite. Go figure. But uh, that's another story. But anyway, I left. We left the group, and then later on, I uh, my wife and I divorced. Uh, for some reason, she went back to celebrating Christmas and Easter and all that. I didn't. I rejected all that because I I I didn't see them as as actual holidays with any merit, and so. Um, but I was still looking. So in 1990, I moved to Dallas, Texas. I, I had been in radio before I joined the cult. I got back into radio. I was program director at a station that was a talk station. And we had to have a last minute replacement for one of our talk show guests that had canceled at the last minute. So I was able to track down Vendel, who who lived uh, nearby in, in Arlington, Texas, which is in the what they call the mixed cities. And... Um, so he was fascinating. He was this renegade archaeologist who had spent 30 years, actually over 30 years, digging for the kalim, the vessels of the, the tabernacle and the temple, and, uh, and had found, apparently, according to him, the, uh, the katorah, the incense. And also in 88, had found a juglet full of oil that believed to have been the shemen meshach, the anointing oil. So... We had him on. He was fascinating. I and when we kept him on for an extra hour, I, and then when he was through, I invited him for a cup of coffee, and I kept him for two more hours there at the radio station in the coffee shop, asking him questions. Then he finally invited me to come out to his Torah classes on the weekend. From that point on, I was studying Torah, and after a while, I was so immersed in it that I I began to help Vendel actually teach his classes when he had to be out of town. 
And I was very, very blessed in this respect because I was, I was everything. I wore many hats when I joined Vendel. I left the radio station and I would drive him to his um, lectures. I would set up his slide projector. Remember those? And I, I really imbibed his, his uh, ideas about archaeology biblically and what he'd been searching for. And every question I asked him was never a stupid question. So I got this crash course in Torah and, and sometimes in Talmud. And often he would have speakers that would come from Eretz Israel and would speak to our class. So the first time that I went to Israel was in 94. It was on the first dig that I went with Vendel. I was the I was the archivist. I shot video for the dig. I was there in Israel for three months. I wanted to convert. And Vendel said, hold on. He said, you know, he said, you don't have to convert to, to have a relationship with Hashem. You can be a Noahide. And I, I'd already heard more about the Noahide laws because Vendel basically couldn't go anywhere without opening his mouth and Torah coming out. Thank God. And so he, uh, I studied more about the, 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 the Sheva Mitzvot. And uh, I thought about converting for a long time. And then, um, surprisingly, a lot of the, the friends I made in Israel, in fact, I have more friends today in Eretz Israel than I have here in the U.S. Um, many of them are, in fact, 99% of them are, are observant Jews, Orthodox Jews. Many of them are rabbis. Many of them are rabbis that you know. And uh, some of those rabbis rabbis told me, they said, Jim, you know, you know, you, you could probably easily convert, but just know this, if you don't convert, you're really having more of an impact on uh, the Nauhide realm just by being a Nauhide. In, in fact, you're even helping out helping us out in the 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 uh, Judaic world, the world of, of the Jewish community. And to that end, I have since, um, I work with a couple of friends of mine in Israel. They're a couple of observant Jews who made Aliyah years ago and started an organization called Foundation Stone. And they uh, basically uh, take archaeological artifacts. They're both, they're both observant Jews, but they're also archaeologists. And they take artifacts from Israel over to J Jewish uh, high schools, Jewish day schools, and I am invited by them to go with them, and I do a lecture on the Exodus and, and my evidence for the Exodus based on, an art, on a book I wrote and a, and a documentary I made. But every time I go over, they, they, they book these, these lectures. They, it's it's a, about a week of lectures for the Jewish community, the Orthodox Jewish community. Well, every time the rabbi of the community finds out that I'm a Noah, they say, Jim, would you come and speak to our shul on Shabbat? So mm -hmm. I've kind of turned it around and I've been able to address them because they always want to know what a Noahide is. They want to see what a real Noahide is. Now, when I'm in Eretz Israel, it's completely different. I can walk down the street and if I had a sign that's, or a t-shirt that said, Ani ben Noach, you know, the, the observant Jewish uh, community knows right away what what an, an Ohide is, but I have found out that that they often don't know as much as I often think they do because you know they've got it's a, it's a busy life being a Jew in Israel. We all know that, and um, so they know they they know the basics of the Noahide laws. They know what a Noahide is, but in the in the Jewish communities in America, it was no surprise for me even Orthodox Jews to walk up to me after one of my talks and say, so do you still believe in, in Jesus? And I go, no. You know, I gave, I divorced myself from that guy a long time ago. And um, so basically, and by the way, I'm here to tell you, uh, especially in, in view of what this entire podcast is about, there is no such thing as a Noahide missionary, please. We just don't do that kind of thing because I've been a Noahide that I, I have identified as a Noahide and embraced the Noahide laws, and even on a couple of occasions, gone before a Beit Dan and signed a statement that I keep the the Sheva Mitzvot. So I can't be an idol worshiper because I've you know because to be an idol worshiper means that you've broken basically the first two laws or at least the first right. law right. of the Sheva Mitzvot. Are you no, asking Jim, me a question, ask rookie? Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, as as a religious Jew, 
I look and I see it all. I see all the resources that we have. We have strong communities. We live in places that are just surrounded by other Jewish people. And then I look at the Noahide communities and I see how strong everybody is because most people are isolated in random communities around the world. And I think that takes incredible courage and incredible perseverance to be able to maintain your faith in the one God of Israel, even though you have a lack of resources. Yeah. So I wanted I wanted you to speak a little bit about how Noahides can navigate the loneliness, the difficulties, the lack of resources. Do you have any advice for them? Well, first of all, I have to say that I think Baruch Hashem, uh, Carol and I, we've never experienced that. And maybe it's because, uh, uh, for instance, our, our kids, you know, our, you, you look at me, I'm 75 years old. So I became an Ohide when I was in my 40s. So, so by then, my parents were both gone. And most of my, a lot of my aunts and uncles were already gone. So I really didn't go through any of that. The, the only, the only downside to being an Ohide was, was before I met Carol, because, because I was divorced when I met her. And being a divorced guy in Dallas, Texas is no fun because most of the women I met wanted to see a profit and loss statement from me, like what my income was. But so I would, when I was dating, this is back when I was 40, this is back in the nineties in my forties, 44, I think I was, I would, I would, I would, uh, I would meet a woman and, and suddenly we'd hit it off. And we, the more we date, I would think, you know, there's potential here for a wife, but I always had one acid test. I would take her to Torah class. So I can remember I had three women I dated in a row, not, not very long that every time I took them to Torah class, I would, we would come out and we'd get back in the car and I'd go, so what did you think? And they go, so you're not a Jew and you're not a Christian. So what are you, a cult? And they didn't want to come back to tour. That was almost the same response <laughs> all three times. So when I met Carol, um, uh, I, I was going to tell a, a long story about meeting Carol, but I'm not going to derail the conversation. So when I met Carol, um, she was all the combination of what I wanted in, in a, a wife. She was, she was both, you know, very intelligent and, and, uh, I thought beautiful, and I still think she's beautiful today. She's my Esher Chayel. So we come out of class, and I was almost afraid to ask her because I wanted to keep dating her. And I said, so what did you think? And she goes, that was really interesting, she said. So anyway, that, so we, anyway, you know, we got married in Israel on a dig, and she showed up on a camel. I'm not making that up. So anyway, we didn't, we didn't have to go through a lot of that because our kids were grown up. And our kids really understand that they're they're not like us in the respect that we're, for want of a better word, we're far more observant as Noahides than they are. But they understand their principles and they, and they embrace them. So we let them live their lives as they want to. And, then, you know, we answer questions when they have them. But the thing about community is I can tell you this, from being a Noahide in the 90s all the way up to today, it's a completely different world for Noahides. I know there are those that have that I have friends in the, that that are young Noahides that have families uh, that that they have almost been uh, ostracized from their families. I was asked uh, a few years ago to give the eulogy of of a, of a Noahide friend who passed away, and he, and that was one of his deathbed wishes was that I give his his eulogy. Guess what? I didn't give the eulogy. You know what happened? His Christian family said, there's no way he's given the eulogy. So I was outvoted. So I understand that. And I will say that there are more resources today for Noahides. There are online, I if she's, I think she's, I can't see all of them, but I know Krista, who who is a longtime Noahide friend, she homeschools her kids. And and I think she's part of a group that actually is producing uh, homeschooling. Uh, resources for Noahide families. There are you can you can go on Facebook right now and you can type in the word Noahide and you'll get all of these online groups that are Noahides. I happen to be close to one called Noahide Online Gathering, and it's mostly families. Uh, we're probably the oldest members of of that group, and from time to time we get together and we have like retreats and the whole family we all get together. We have a we have we may have a couple of guest lectures. Otherwise, it's just it's just family time, and we we'll talk about our our uh, uh, challenges as Noahides. So there are plenty of if you'll just 
you know, if you're online, Google, go to Facebook. Um, there are plenty of resources now for families, and they're growing all the time because the Noahide phenomena is 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 growing exponentially. The, the, the question that I'm often asked when I speak in synagogues or meet Jewish, make Newton Jewish friends, is how many are there of you? Well, I don't know. Uh, all I know is that they're all over the world and they're coming out of the woodwork. And really, Ruki, to the Jewish friends in our audience, the more that the Jewish community, and I'm talking about the secular Jews, uh, the more that they make tshuva, and the more that they go back to Torah and they embrace it, and the more that Israel, I'm Israel in Eretz Israel, they, 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 and, and of course, October 7th has had a profound effect. I don't have to tell any of you in Israel Absolutely. the effect it had, but it, 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 it changed the world. And, and I, I, this is hard to say, but, but Hashem, everything Hashem does is for the good. And, and this is my, my watchword. Gamzola Tova. Everything really is for the good. And and there is even a silver lining around this horrible thing that happened to our, our Jewish brothers and sisters down near Gaza. And that is, is that the unity I'm seeing now in Eretz Israel is unlike anything I've seen before. And the fact that we've had to gather around and we've had to we've had to speak out against this madness. That, all of my friends in the Noahide community, we're doing our part by by maintaining this presence online and, and you know, uploading videos wow. and saying things and defending the, the people of Israel and the Jewish community at large. And and uh, I, that probably will even answer several questions. But I don't know that I've answered your question really as much as you want me to, Ruki, but I hope I have. I don't know if I have or not. We'll go into it maybe a little bit more, um, a little further on in the program. I actually wanted to switch over to Rabbi Yochanan now, and I wanted to ask him about the efforts to break apart our unity. There are mm. so many missionaries that are attacking the Jewish community now, especially in Eretz Israel. Since October 7th, they're just like coming in en masse. They're flooding the land. They are, they're getting very close to survivors. You're in Eretz Israel, I believe? Are yes, you in Israel yes, now? Yes. So you're seeing it live firsthand. Um, and I don't know if it's okay to bring up, I hope it is, but I heard through the grapevine that you were quite su successful in your missions to people when you were back in the church. And I wanted you to speak about different tactics that missionaries use, what the Jewish people should be on the lookout for, how to circumvent it, what, what should we be aware of, and how do we combat it? Well, Ruhi, as you, as you said, um, I, I really uh, was a, a pastor in Texas, and uh, my experience to missionaries is, is by, by analogy. It, it's like uh, uh, in my neighborhood, for example, there was a, there was an, uh, a, a family, perhaps a, a single lady that happened to be a, a Jewish uh, uh, what is it called? The Messianic Jew. Uh, she was in our neighborhood, and 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 they had been uh, putting uh, leaflets door to door, and and the 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 men around my shul uh, said, "Did you hear about this, Yohanan?" And I did, I thought, "Why? Why is everybody else seeing this and I'm not?" When 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 I could be the uh, part of the the solution for for what's happening in our immediate neighborhood. And, and and it happens the same way when somebody happens to be in Yerushalayim and 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 they they happen upon a person on on the on the corner uh, uh, preaching or or handing out leaflets and and I've only seen it from from a distance. So and and, and in my personal practice in, in Texas, whereas I I did uh, take a course in, in, from our uh, from my. Uh, theological seminary. Uh, it was called uh, Teaching the Teachers, and it was a course on uh, how to go about evangelizing, and it, it was all supposed to be done within eight minutes from the time that you made the contact uh, to the time that the person uh, accepts Jesus as their Savior. It, it should have been done in eight minutes, and, and wow. that's maybe what you heard mm -hmm. that 
I, I used to brag uh, about my uh, uh, my uh, my ability to bring a person to their knees in under eight minutes. That it seemed like it was a badge of, uh, of honor to me. Um, what what what's happening here in Israel is definitely an eye opener uh, because we have never seen in the history of uh, the evangelical movement, the missionary movement, such such blatant, brazen attempts to to convert us. But uh, how do I feel about that, Rahi? I. I I, I'm not going to say I have mixed emotions, but I am going to maybe play the devil's advocate, if you will, uh, and by saying the following. I, I think the Christian missionaries, bless their hearts, they, they're actually following the instructions of their own Bible. They can't help but do what they're supposed to do. If they didn't do what they're supposed to, what their Bible tells them to do, well, they would be disingenuous. They wouldn't be really Christians. They have, for example, the, the commission, the great commission, according to Matthew 28, verse 19. It, it tells them to go out and, and, and baptize uh, as many people in the nations as possible. And, of course, we're the, the, the we're in their crosshairs as as Jews, um, and 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 yes, of course, we've got that. They, they're driven by that. They really believe that that's what uh, that their work in the mission field is going to uh, usher in quickly the arrival of their Messiah. And, and 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 that's why you see a lot of uh, very horrible attempts that we have many of us here in Israel uh, have heard about, read about, um, about uh, missionaries actually mm -hmm. putting on a Jewish garb, looking so Hasidic, so religious with their long beard, pay all the the side locks, dressing in long coats, wearing their sit seats uh, on uh, on on the uh, outside, and blending into of all places, Meisharim. Meisharim in, in Yerushalayim for our audience is a place that is very very orthodox, very very much a, a Jewish uh, on, enclave for uh, mm -hmm. uh, for them to go in there. It's like the chutzpah. It's like uh, the audacity you, you you wonder what's on their mind as and then i i remind myself that again they're just following what the bible tells them the uh, the the paul in uh, uh chapter uh of uh first corinthians chapter 9 verse 20 and 20 and 22 it says it gives us their game plan if i'm not suggesting that anybody go read but it tells us what they're supposed to do it, paul said to the jew i became like a jew so that i could win the jews to the uh, to the people that were under the law i pretended uh, this is me paraphrasing that i was an observant jew under the law so that i could convince them that they were in the wrong so that's their playbook, and 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 how we're going to react to it is, it, it it's a it's a sad state of affairs for me to observe that our people at at many levels, from the level of the government, the Knesset, all the way down to the local rabbi, they they're not ready. They 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 just kind of. I'm not going to say that they've missed the boat, hush for shalom, but they have lived for many, many decades with the idea that oh, that's them, that's okay. They're the Christians, let them be, you know, as long as they don't bother us. But that's no longer naivete. True. Uh, apparently, but 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 see what's really crazy is that we are not naive. We have the light of Torah. We have so much wisdom in the books and pages of our sages that it's crazy. What what is happening? Sanhedrin, the Masechet Sanhedrin, tells us it, it, You know, we're not. A, we don't subscribe as Jews to 
to that Christian concept of turn the other cheek. It says, our sages taught us, if someone comes planning to kill you, you should hurry and kill him first. Now, I'm not suggesting, as for Shalom, I'm, what I'm not saying, what I'm saying is, I'm not saying that Christians want to kill us physically. That apparently is something that October 7th left very clear that they are not here to kill us physically, but they are here to take away our neshamot, our souls. And I got to wonder, which is worse? Which is worse, to lose your soul to, or, or to lose your body? Which is worse? I, I don't have an answer for that. But uh, that, that's, that's what's happening here. And, 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 and it's their tactics, their lies that we're not ready for. We, we trust. We trust. We, we, we have, as you know, uh, one of our, our, our mantras or, uh, is, is we give everyone the benefit of the doubt, especially a Jewish brother or sister. We trust that, that they are telling us the truth. So it's very heartbreaking when we hear that a person was in disguise and for several years and and did some mitzvot, uh, married people, maybe even did uh, Brit Mil uh, Milah. I don't know to what extent, but it, it is a tragedy that we need to stop. And how do we stop it? By education. We educate ourselves. It, it, it's an amazing thing that I, I think I, I passed it on to uh, Naomi and, and perhaps you also. Uh, I, I put it on Facebook. There was this um, MK, this uh, member of Knesset, that a few days ago got uh, on her podium and started telling the Knesset members how they, because of their laws, had prevented her from being a proper Jewish lady, that she did not was not given an opportunity through the educational system here in Israel to learn about Torah, to to live a Jewish life. They robbed her of that. She sounded, and I told this to someone. I think it was Jim. She sounded like a woman that has been that had been violated. That was the emotion that was coming through. Wow. And, and, and in things, Baruch Hashem, they're, they're changing for the good. The fact that this Knesset member got up in front of her colleagues, political colleagues, and called them out, it made a, a, a public indictment of, of the government uh, here in Israel, mm -hmm. is a step in the right direction. And, wow. uh, and, and the, re the rest of us should lockstep right behind her. And, and this is the time. The time is now to strike in, in, in with, with the light, to, to, to make that light shine from our hearts into the hearts and minds of the non-Jewish world. The, and how the, do we the, do that? Well, there, there's, a, there's a story that somebody told me a couple of days ago about a, a young woman and her mother. Uh, apparently, the the mother in this story has had the habit of inviting all types of people from the neighborhood. Some of them, okay, a little doubtful in their in their uh, conduct. Maybe even their dress was not the best or appropriate for a very religious uh, woman or family. And and the and the daughter says that she'd come home in the evenings and find wall to wall people. And, and the only way she could figure out how many people were there, she says, I used to start counting feet. How many feet are there here in this in, in this room or in this house? And that's how she knew how many. And so one day she says that she walked to her, up to her mother and says, Mom, what's, what's, what's going on here? I mean, like, we've got all these people that are coming. I mean, they're, they're secular. They're not religious Jews. They're this, they're that. And, and, and the mom tells her, sweetheart, let me tell you something. There are only two types of people in this world. There are Jews and there are Noahides. And that was powerful message because we as a as a Jewish nation 
we have compartmentalized ourselves. There's the Ashkenazim, there's the Sephardic, and we have that that oh, good old joke where the guy is in the deserted on a deserted island. He builds two synagogues, the one he goes to and the one he doesn't go to, and every one of us laughs. Why? We laugh because it's it's real. We know people like that. We might even be a person like that. And she's saying, this lady is saying, we've got to change. That's that to answer your question, to your point, we've got to change our mindset. We've got to change how we approach people on a daily on a daily basis. And we've got to, I believe, that's where our initiative comes in. We've got to tell the world there's no such thing as a Christian. There's no such thing as a Hindu. There's no such thing as anything other than there is Torah. And you're either an ambassador of Torah, which we call it in this mm-hmm. world, a Jew, or you're a B'nai Noach, part of the nations. There's no other thing. And that's the education that has to start with our governors, with all the way down to our local rabbis. Jim, let me ask you a question. You were speaking about how, you know, the, the Noahides don't go out and missionize. But no. at the same time, you know, Jewish people are very much into, you know, let's share the Torah, but not in an overly pushy way. The question is, is like, obviously, we want to combat the Christian missionaries who are coming and trying to bring the Jewish people away from the Torah and to a foreign belief system. But at the same time, we want to draw forth the nation. So what do you feel is like the boundary point for outreach when it comes to both the Jewish people reaching the Noahide community and the Christians trying to reach the Jewish people? What do you uh, think is I- the difference? I, the, the difference is is that I think that uh, there's a there's a local level there's a global level to that to that question or to to that aspect of of outreach and the thing is is that w- when uh, I first got into you know Torah and and studying Torah and becoming Noahide and then I, and then I got thanks to Vendel I became a little more well known I would get emails from either Noahides or potential Noahides who they would go to a, a shul, they'd go to a synagogue, and they'd ask if they could study Torah, and the, and they would uh, email me, and this is years ago, by the way, and they would say, you know, uh, they won't even return my calls. So I think that I think that that's changed, hopefully. I, I haven't heard that complaint uh, that often anymore. But really, th- the main thing is, is that I, I would maintain that that still needs to be uh, an attitude that the Jewish community, especially especially the Orthodox shuls, they need to maintain a. Obviously, they have you know the Jewish people have good reason to be suspicious. History proves that. But I think I give I give the rabbis in the American Jewish community, well, of, of really anywhere, I give them uh, credit for having the discernment to be able to tell whether someone is asking because they genuinely want to study Torah, because they want to become closer to God. And and I would say that when they can determine that, they should allow someone in to, uh, or, you know, it, at least some some limited uh, way to study Torah with, uh, or even some, some have even set up separate classes for people who want to study Torah. The more the Jewish community worldwide comes back to Torah and lives their lives according to Torah, and, and more and more make Aliyah, I guarantee you the non-Jews are going to respond. That's why that's why they're responding right now. Years ago, actually, I'm thinking about a couple that I met. Uh, I brought a friend of mine from Israel over on a speaking tour, and I, I uh, at that time I was a little younger, and they came over to me, and they said, are you Jim Long? And I said, yeah. I said, we want to meet you. We want to tell you that we're brand new Noahides. And I said, well, I said, really? I said, how old are you? And and they they were in their 70s. Of course, I'm in my 70s now. <laughs> so uh, I thought, well, they're an older couple. So anyway, I said, so in your 70s, you've left the church? Well, we have to tell our pastor, but we're going to leave. And so they they responded to the no hide laws. By the way, uh, this won't be any, any news to a lot of the people watching this podcast. 
the reason they decided that they were Noahides and they were going to embrace the Sheva Mitzvot and they were going to start studying Torah because they had a hunger for real truth. They said, well, I said, how did you how did you make that leap? And they said, well, we've been watching Tovia Singer's tapes. And they had gone to Tovia's website because they had heard what Tovia was doing to fight missionizing, which, of course, has been his whole, you know, decades long mission. And they said, we were going to go to we were going to prove him wrong. So we thought, we'll listen to his tapes. And they said, we didn't expect it, but we recognized the truth. We couldn't dispute the truth when we saw it. And by the way, just to, not as a point of bragging about it, but, you know, people, I don't know what's wrong, but but every, you know, you have, you once in a while, somebody will pop up and they'll question you. And they'll say, is that guy really genuine? He's a non-Jew, you know, and and I don't know why, but somebody always wants to criticize. And so, in the past, I've been criticized of being like a closet Christian still. I don't know how that happens, but it does. And um, I remember one, when, when the Internet was really beginning to, to really grow, I remember a guy kept this website, and he, uh, he was supposed to be like a watchdog uh, over you know people who claim that they embraced the Torah. And my wife and I showed up in there, as, and and, and uh, it mentioned Vendel, who I, at, at that time I was working for full time. They said that we had, that my wife and I, we, he named us and said they had co-opted Vendel because they were CIA agents. And I, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that showed up. So anyway, I, I just want to mention that because if it happens again, you got to know that two of the videos that, um, Tovia cells were shot by me. Two, two of his two of his um, debates with Christian ministers were videotaped by me. I edit the videotape and then I authored the DVDs for him. And I'm also when you when you read uh, his Let's Get Biblical, which I recommend to anybody who's coming out of Christianity. If you read the second volume, I wrote the preface. So I'm not exactly somebody who goes around as a closet Christian. So I just want to put that to rest right <laughs> away. But anyway, wow. I, I, I kind of over, I, I think that, I think it would be appropriate before we keep everybody too long to everybody's probably wondering like, what is Jim and this uh, uh, Jewish gentleman named Yochanan? Why are we on the same podcast together? And Yochanan can talk about it a little bit. It's because Yochanan started what he called the B'nai Noach Initiative. And he contacted me and asked if, he, if I would be part of it. Yochanan, take it away. Well, uh, thank you, Jim. Um, it, it is a, a, uh, an initiative that uh, Jim, Larry, and I, Larry Bontrager, that uh, hopefully uh, we'll uh, present him sometime in the future. Um, it, it actually happened at a Shabbat table where uh, Larry, who is another Noahide, uh, uh, had known him, both uh, Jim and Larry for uh, close to 10 years by now. And we had connected uh, because I, at that time, about eight to 10 years ago, I, I was volunteering with Brit Olam, uh, Rabbi Shirky, and I was... Uh, collecting data uh, of uh, Noahides in uh, South Central Mexico, uh, South America, Central America, and Mexico. And uh, we were creating at that time a database. And through certain contacts that I had, uh, which were mutual between Jim and, and I, uh, we ended up meeting one uh, one day uh, on the uh, whole uh, Emek Rafaim in in Yerushalayim, which is on, on Emek Rafaim is a is a main uh, English speaking uh, strip of of coffee shops and and all sorts of stores and restaurants, and uh, that's where I met Jim for the first time, and and it was because I was interested in reaching the non-Jews, not for the purpose of uh, converting them to Judaism, but for the purpose of, uh, of just uh, encouraging them to continue 
in 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 in, in their in, on their journey out of Christianity, and and that's how we ended up uh, uh, again for reasons that I can't go into uh, at this time. Um, I, I lost uh, myself in 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 work and other things. Uh, as Jim was saying earlier, it, uh, it it's not an easy life that we have here uh, on, on different levels. And so I dedicated myself to running a small company. And uh, what I thought was a short time ended up, I think, uh, almost 10 years when we, uh, Jim and I reconnected. And it was just the uh, last couple of months. And, and uh, the story... Yeah, it was at that. That's exactly right. Uh, Larry was was there. Uh, Larry Bontrager. He was at my home, and he was kind of like uh, reminiscing about Jim and and I and he and what we were doing together, how we met, and one thing led to another, and I and he, Larry, just reignited that passion that I had to reach to the non-Jewish world. And uh, we both uh, thought that it was the time and we got uh, uh, Jim involved. And the next thing we know, we're, we're planning uh, this initiative, putting a mission statement, uh, contacting rabbis uh, in order for them to supervise us, look over our shoulder, if you will. We gave them an official name of uh, advisory board uh, to which I think all three of them blushed uh, and because they didn't want to have any type of uh, of a uh, public view or much less a, a title. They just kind of like walked away from that. But the, all three of them uh, said to us, we will uh, support you. We will give you our advice. I, I think, and I haven't, I, I, I don't know, Jim, maybe you know more uh, about between the three of them. I, I think there we've got, close to a hundred years of life experience and and life in, in in Israel I, I I would imagine that uh, one of them dates himself he was 15 years old in 1964 when he was living here and and uh, so I don't know if you've done the math I I, I tried and I'm I'm guessing that uh, so anyway all of that to say that we've got uh, some very uh, uh, important, sound, wise uh, rabbis that are looking over our shoulders, and um, and we just—that's uh, where we're holding. That's how uh, how we came to to. to Can I ask what exactly your um, organization is that that it does? What is what kind of steps does it take to reach the nations? Um, okay, uh, we, we have a, a mission statement, uh, Rahi, that, that I think will mm-hmm. will we'll, uh, share or reveal what we're uh, uh, attempting to do. Um, I'm good. I will read it uh, to you, and uh, it's about uh, three three prong uh, uh, mission statement. I'm just going to try to paraphrase it. It it says that. It, it, this is like from coming from the heart and mind of, of a Noahide. And, and it says that as adherence to the seven universal laws, uh, they, uh, the Noahides uh, in this initiative want to work in, in, with, uh, in a collaborative uh, fashion with government uh, offices here in Israel, the offices mm-hmm. of the chief rabbis, with construction industries, with businesses, in order to eventually provide uh, a qualified workers. And uh, as part of this initiative, the Noahides also would like to seek to promote uh, global awareness of the seven universal laws. Uh, all of these initiatives are very, very I- I ambitious. And we can't go into very much detail because all of these initiatives are in the oven, so to speak. They're, they're baking as we speak. Um, you can appreciate the fact that when we're talking about an initiative like I mentioned, the, the first one, and speaking to government offices, uh, the chief rabbis, it's not just picking up a phone and saying, Hello, uh, Benjamin. Uh, how 
I, did, I didn't mean to say that, but okay. <laughs> uh, how are you doing? Can you help us with that? Um, so uh, we're 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 attempting with the advice of our rabbis to to move in a very calculated and intentional fashion, and part of that journey that I'm describing involves people and organizations such as yourself, because this cannot be done just under one organization. You and others like you that have organizations, uh, uh, we, we, we really embrace the opportunity to, to, uh, uh, to work with, uh, with you together towards that end it, 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 as, as we kind of like, uh, you know, partition, divide the work. You can imagine when when the Jewish agency says that there are 67 million B'nai uh, children of the ones that were forced into conversions. I am a product of that. And we went into the churches. It, it was the, the, the natural place to go hide for many of, of my ancestors in the Hispanic world. And, and, and Baruch Hashem, I hope that this is the time for, for me and for others that have a heart for the Hispanic uh, people, uh, the Hispanics. Somebody told me once, there are a lot of Jewish souls caught in Hispanic bodies. And we went to we, we I, just uh, want to uh, uh, yeah. try to get them out uh, from from where uh, where they've been. I just wanted to add to to what Yochanan was talking about, and that is the fact that it's interesting mm -hmm. that this this initiative really happened right on the heels of October the seventh. Through to again, you know, underscore the fact that that a lot of things changed, and w the thing is is that we uh, what we're doing is the the primary mission statement. That, that Yochanan was leading to, that we actually drafted an official statement, is is really just to make the world aware of the Sheva vote. Because um, if we can do that, and we have a couple of things we can't talk about that we're planning on, but Yochanan, do you want do you want me to talk about the stone that we are we are producing? I, I think I, I think okay, that that's, quickly, uh, that's something that I'll we quickly discussed that we do should. This and if I can. Uh, we, uh, I got a, I got a, uh, I got contacted by a young, uh, young man in Austin, Texas, Noah Hyde, right on the, he said, he, he said, he told me, he said that he was on a walk October the 7th in Austin. And he said he hadn't even heard of what had happened yet. And he said he got this strong feeling that, that no, that more people needed to become Noah Hydes. And so, then he found out what had happened, and he he felt even more strongly about it. So he had this idea that he said that that we should contact Jewish friends in Israel, and and make it so that there is a plaque or a framed version or some version of the Shevmitz vote, that every time a, a visiting dignitary from a foreign country came to Israel, that someone in an official position before they left would present them a gift. And the gift would be the Sheva Mitzvot. Please take this as a gift from the Jewish people. And the, to us, to, to Yochanan and I and Larry, this is a way of, it's, it's in a small measure, it's sort of leaning into the idea of spreading of the Jewish people, fulfilling what the Rambam said. So the Promoting first thing- the, uh, the global awareness, yeah. The global awareness. Mm -hmm. and, and so the thing is, look, you, you might even on a, a very mundane level call it a, a, a kind of publicity, kind of public relations idea. Fine, whatever it takes so that the, so that the phrase Noahide law, Sheva Mitzvot, are on, the, are on the lips of people all over the world. And so the, the way, and, and I don't know if we're stumbling around doing this, but it seemed like a, I told the, the young man, I said, that's a brilliant, simple idea. And so what we did is we had a stone made we decided to make a stone, and if I can show this, if I don't uh, mess up the uh, what's it's what our we're doing it's here. our prototype. It's yeah, our, our pro it's our prototype. That is our so-called for for want of a better word, we're calling it our Noahide stone. It's on it's engraved on Jerusalem stone. We had it made there in in Eretz Israel. It has the Shevamitz vote. This is what we want to present to those who visit Eretz Israel. 
these these leaders in, in the leadership positions and and uh very home profile you know if if we had been a, if we'd been ahead of the game we definitely would have tried to present it to the president of Argentina when he visited and i think he would have readily accepted it joyfully but it's I and on the so back well. of it on the back of it will in in a in cardboard will affix to in the language of the recipient an explanation of the Shevimitz vote and the list of the Shevimitz vote in the recipient's language. So that's that's one we're, that we're working on right now. And it's incredibly complicated because, you know, we're anyway. I'll just as, say you, it's as you can imagine, Rocky, we're we're talking about uh, speaking to diplomats. Uh, and and so it's it's something that we have to move with a great care with right. a lot out of dotting of the I's and crossing the T's. 100%. Wow. Sounds like an unbelievable initiative. And may Hashem help you with your efforts. And may we merit to greet Mashiach very, very soon. If anybody wants to catch up on previous issues of Speak Up, you can subscribe to at Speak Up underscore Amisrol on Instagram and on YouTube. And you can see the previous issues that were done. So thank you everybody for joining us.